Sure. Well, I want to welcome everybody who's joined in. Uh, we had discussions amongst multiple of the uh, chairs for the uh, IARPIC teams, and the issue of food security crosses over to the ones that, particularly the ones that are sponsoring this. Uh, it will be a series of uh, webinars, the marine ecosystem, the health and well-being, and the coastal resilience, and particularly related to um, uh, environmental issues, uh, food security issues in, in the Pacific Arctic, but also has relevancy to uh, pan-Arctic discussions. So with that, um, there will be uh, future ones led by the other uh, team members, and I think the next one is probably in January, but we'll bring that up at the end. So I'll go briefly through this. We have a packed agenda. I wanted to talk about the, uh, the status of some of the updates of, from the Distributed Biological Observatory in relation to this topic. Um, just a few points. We all know that there's a reduction of sea ice in the warming uh, waters. And we've been seeing this with the cruises that have been able to go out in 2020. And we are seeing biological change everywhere from uh, prey to predators. Uh, movement of uh, fish going northward, uh, subarctic uh, species going to uh, into the Chukchi Sea, and also various uh, stressors on that. We look at the within the observing system. We look at everything from the water column uh, to uh, trophic levels to upper uh, marine mammal and seabird observations. But we also look at the sediments for indicators of overlying processes. And I'm just going to mention two of the uh, cruises as they relate to uh, this topic of food security. And just point out that there all have been a few other of our international colleagues that will be able to present at future webinars. So most of you know what the DBO is. It's a change detection array, array that we have from the northern uh, Pacific, uh, northern part of the northern Bering Sea into the Beaufort Sea. And the ones I'm going to speak about today are the uh, DBO one through five from uh, south of St. Lawrence Island up to Uktiavik off of uh, Barrow Canyon area. It does extend into, and we have Canadian colleagues and US colleagues working up in this northern part. Um, to point out, due to COVID, we've had limited cruises, and I'm going to mention a few of those, those aspects uh, during the talk. Um, at the same time, on one of these cruises was associated with the Ecosystem Fisheries and Oceanography of NOAA's coordinated investigations, and we were able to put together a cruise that went out in the August September period that I'll go over and also about some of the findings uh, from the uh, Norseman 2 crews that enabled us to do some of these studies and make collections, for example, for harmful algal blooms in, in October. So you can see the composite of many different, uh, because of the limited logistics, we were able to combine both funding sources as well as activities from a lot of these different programs, including the AMBOM program, which is a biodiversity <coughs> observing network, and to turn around the Chukchi Environmental Observatory. Just a minute, baby. Right so there. one point I wanted to mention is that besides doing phys uh, the oceanographic measurements, there are also multiple moorings with sensors that are important, looking at ca uh, carbon export. There are gliders and also uh, expendable buoys that have been put out into the system. Uh, what's next? Why isn't it going? Excuse me. So just briefly, uh, the warming seawaters are having an impact on the trophic level. So there's a change in the spring ice uh, retreat. There's been a reduction, potential reductions that can impact on the ice edge production as well as the timing. And the importance of this is the changing uh, uh, production period that can then influence the type of composition of uh, the lipid rich ice algae when it may be produced. And when you have open water production as you see on the figure on the right. Uh, changing the timing can influence how many zooplankton are in the water column. So you have uh, bowhead feeding on zooplankton, seabirds feeding on them, obviously, and uh, their uh, impacts. And their grazing then influences the underlying uh, production of the benthic animals, which are important for such things as gray whales, diving sea ducks, and walrus. But as far as food security, it's, it's this change in prey composition and abundance the uh, in the water column and sediments, as well as uh, food webs, and as I mentioned, for the harmful algal blooms and uh, impacts of ocean acidification. So, just briefly to see this, uh, we we're seeing ocean acidification in the uh, particularly in the in the northeast Chukchi Sea here. This is a very rich area of marine clams for walrus feeding, but in a lot of organic material, which then drives the 
uh, omega-1 or the pH levels lower that then can be corrosive to uh, organisms that build calcite and aragonite. Um, and also the harmful algal blooms, and I see that Don Anderson is on here. Um, they are increasing in the Pacific Arctic. Uh, there have been blooms of Alexandrium. We saw them when we went out on the, the Healy Cruise in 2019. And we are, uh, it's a, a paralytic shellfish poisoning for that. And uh, Don can provide some uh, overview it's, uh, and, and has uh, presentations before on that. But that is an issue influencing uh, the, the type of uh, quality of the food that's available up the trophic level. This is one example of the uh, findings from the 2019 studies because we just managed to do collections both in the water column during the Oscar Dyson cruise in August and September, as well as in the sediments in our October cruise. And the findings have been uh, uh, back in 2017, 18, 19, is that there's an accumulation of the cysting of the, from these uh, dinoflagellates and also blooming in the, in the water column. And uh, some of the highest levels have been found in the clams in the Cherokoff Basin that were collected, as well as up here off of the uh, Ledyard Bay region in this area. And they are then consumed by uh, walruses or other organisms. They're also consumed by inhabitants of the, uh, along the coastal, which then has an influence on the food security. These two red areas that you're seeing here are air, the seafood safety regulation of saxitoxin were higher than the, uh, uh, there are very high levels in those clams. So we're very interested in the data collection and having it processed this year. We both work with Dawn's group out of Woods Hole as well as uh, Catherine Leheve for the, uh, the NOAA program. Then briefly, we know that there's a northward movement of commercial fish and the contraction of the coal pool. This is some of Lyle Britt's uh, findings in here. Uh, but the important point is that the NOAA annual trawl surveys due to COVID were not able to go out this year to be able to do those type of investigations. So we were able fortunately to combine with NIMS and the NOAA Arctic Research Program to do a cruise on the Oscar Dyson and combined them, uh, left Seattle on the 24th of August, returned to Kodiak on the 25th of September after COVID quarantines. And the, the collections that were made, you can see there were uh, water column, mooring retrievals, a lot of activities to combine with a lot of collaborative programs to in order to uh, successfully process a lot of information that was collected all the way up uh, through the whole Bering Sea, turning moorings around, and then being able to look at the DBO lines and also to be able to do uh, seabird observations. At the same time, one of the findings was this, uh, the seawater temperatures and Phyllis Stabenow gave a nice talk at the, um, for the Nome Bering Strait talks. Both the surface and bottom waters were wa warmer than normal uh, during this period of time of August and uh, September which then will influence the, uh, when the sea, uh, sea ice will return to the system and how the ecosystem is then set up for the following year. For the uh, Norseman II cruise, we were able to then also collect a water column, chemical measurements. Uh, I would point out that the chlorophyll, this is one thing I will show you, we were surprised to find the blooms that were going on in October. We also had zooplankton, benthic. So this is the prey base for a lot of the uh, uh, marine mammals, the uh, migrations were coming south. Uh, we had the bowheads in this area, but we still had gray whales, uh, humpback whales uh, in the southern Chukchi Sea, uh, diving sea ducks, marine birds uh, transiting this region. So we were able to do those collections, a lot of them, including uh, collecting for uh, sediments and uh, dominant animals for the uh, harmful algal blooms. And just briefly summary on this is that you're going, I would just point out the warmer water we have coming from the south up to the north, um, cold sailing water on the bottom. But this is the point that we were most surprised because we were actually doing the analysis on the, um, on the ship was that we were getting uh, blooms, moderate level blooms, some of them matching what we had in certain regions of the, uh, in July and August. And this occurred both in the Southeast and the Northeast Chukchi Sea. And at the same time while this was going on, I would point out re related to uh, food security is the uh, activities that go on with the human use of longline fishing was going on the, in the Cherokoff Basin 
and we had a large cargo ship passing through Bering Strait during this time. So besides the ecological uh, changes that we're seeing in this region, we have the, the human influence, increased transportation, as well as fishing activities. And then I just want to conclude with this, uh, the new uh, research uh, network uh, that uh, HIO ICON has. It's the looking at the coordinated observation of Arctic change, this co-ops RNA. And there's a Google site you can look at here. The objectives is coastal and marine food security. So it's going to be a series and Hio would be nice to, he can add some, I think he's on the line information on that, but the DBO will be interacting with this uh, activity to connect coastal uh, groups with uh, ongoing long-term observations in the region to increase coordination. And then they're gonna focus on food security in the coastal and marine uh, environment, working with local communities, national and international research teams. So there's a composite, as I said, Hio is on the line here and can provide further information on that. So with that, I just would say thank you for your attention, uh, funders and so forth, a couple of websites to be able to, this is the newest one we put together here, uh, combining for the uh, DBO results. Uh, and then at that point, I think uh, we might, before I take any questions, want to go on with some of the observations, uh, the coastal observing that's uh, next on the uh, agenda. And Meredith, I think you have that list. Sure, yes. Unless anybody has a quick question while she changes out. So Erica is next um, and she's doing a Leo network update. For those who are over the phone, um, on our website, on the event page, the these slides, the ones that Jackie just went through, as well as the ones that for Erica and Donna um, are there. And um, just to make a note um, to Jackie, uh, who's chairing this meeting, um, Charlene and Gay, it looks like they're both here as well. Excellent. Okay, Erica. All right, so hello everyone and thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to this group. My name is Erica Lujan and I coordinate the Local Environmental Observer or LEO network at the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium here in Anchorage, Alaska. Um, so we are the statewide arm of the tribal health system here in the state and we provide a range of medical, community health, engineering, and environmental health services. Um, so, you know, throughout our work, we definitely hear and understand that the environment is rapidly changing. And in 2012, we launched the LEO network as a tool for observers to document these changes they're experiencing. Um, so there's four primary steps to our process. Um, we ask people to submit an observation of unusual environmental events um, the LEO editors uh, will add any sort of contextual information and forward the observation to someone who can provide more information. Uh, we send that back to the observer and then publish it to our website at leonetwork.org. So we have 72 observations of changes to the environment that observers have identified as impacting food security in Alaska. Um, so these cover a really wide range of events, as you can probably see in the examples here. Um, which describe changes in berry abundance, changes in water levels affecting fishing, uh, and erosion reshaping an important hunting lookout. So the majority of the observed changes to the natural environment that affect food security are related to fish, uh, changes to the ocean, changes to ice, ice and snow, uh, but also weather. Um, we do know, though, that many of the observations uh, describing changes to fish and marine mammals um, were related to the die-off events last summer. So that's part of what's driving those numbers. Uh, but we also ask observers to categorize the type of event that they're seeing, which affects food security. Um, so we're primarily seeing changes in seasonal timing, um, instances of deformity, disease, or injury, death, die-off, or decline, or extreme temperatures, among others. Um, so I mentioned that we received uh, observations about um, salmon die-offs and marine mammal die-offs. Uh, last year, we received 11 observations of pre-spawn salmon who died in unusually warm weather or who died when river levels became uh, too low or dried up completely. We also received nine observations of dead or dying sea mammals uh, last summer, some of which coincided 
um, with seabird die-offs and die-offs uh, in krill. Um, but some of the other fish observations that we've received this year also relate to low water, um, as is the case in the observations from Elam and Nome, um, but also relate to other unidentified environmental stressors that killed tomcod near Teller um, and resulted in dead and malformed eggs uh, found in a silver salmon caught in Quinnahawk, um, where they also experienced low water. Um, but we're also hearing how changes in sea ice are affecting sea mammal hunts. Um, so in her observation from Kivalina shown here, um, Janet describes how families are traveling farther than usual um, and how the ability of some families to, to travel is really dependent on the size of their boats. Um, so in Wales, uh, Robert also mentions the importance of predictable sea ice conditions for the spring sea mammal hunt. Um, and his comment comes after whales loft, lost their shore fast ice unusually early in the season. Uh, changes in seasonal timing of weather is also affecting food preservation methods. Um, so in another observation from Janet and Kivalina, she describes how they are hunting bearded seals earlier, but how unseasonable rain makes it difficult to properly dry the meat. So this is a photo here of her actually drying meat in her home to protect it from the rain. Uh, this year, we also heard um, similar observations from uh, Rosemary in Nuixit, um, who described the impact of cloudy weather and of smoke in the air um, as they were trying to dry their fish. Uh, a lot of their uh, whitefish became moldy. Um, and we also heard from Carol in Golovin about um, how people were afraid to eat fish that they had dried in unusually warm summer weather. Uh, but to end on a rather pleasant note, we also heard about um, warm temperatures in the interior coinciding with early ripe blueberries. So that's at least something that we can all look forward to. Uh, we definitely encourage everyone to join the LEO network and explore these observations more fully. Um, so using the advanced search tool on our homepage, you can filter the content to show the observations related to food security um, or any of the other filters uh, seen there. So I do apologize, I have to leave this meeting a little bit early, um, but I am looking forward to revisiting the conversation and definitely invite anyone uh, to email or call me directly with any questions. So thank you so much. Thank you, Erica. Maybe since you're gonna be leaving, do you have, maybe if people have a question or two, they can ask you now? Sure, absolutely. And if not, we can put it into the chat and we'll email it to you. That sounds fantastic. Thank you guys so much. Great. And so these observations though, they're sitting on, they're on your website, right? So summaries of them every year? Yes. Um, so all of our observations are available at leonetwork.org. Um, you do have to be a member to view the entire observation, um, but signing up is very easy. Um, and we definitely welcome um, anyone who is interested uh, and then invite you to, to comment on observations or otherwise share your expertise. All right. Well, thank you so much, Erica. Does anybody else have a question yet? If not, put it in the chat, please. Okay, thank you. Okay, so our, our next speaker, speaker is uh, AOKH, the food security uh, with Donna Hauser. There she is. Great, okay. Just share here. Okay, uh, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Donna Hauser. I am research faculty at the International Arctic Research Center at UAF, and one of the one of the science hats that I lead is as the science lead for the Alaska Arctic Observatory and Knowledge Hub, which we refer to as AOK. So I'm going to really quickly run through some of our 2020 highlighting or observing highlights um, from our so that the AOK program is a year round sustained community-based observing program um, focusing on coastal areas from Kotzebue through Kaktovik. And, let's see. okay, so um, this is just kind of our, our only overview slide where I'm trying to give you a, a sampling of how AOK represents a really diverse set of observations as well as observing protocols. Um, so you can kind of just see the, the overview in this diagram. But um, today I'm gonna to focus on the cornerstone of our project, which is really the local observations um, provided by Inupiaq observers. Um, and again, they're providing these 
really holistic year round community based observations. Um, and so ultimately, I kind of consider the whole suite of our observing efforts to in some way be related back to food security. Um, and uh, because we had observations in throughout 2020 from seven observers in five communities spanning across 1500 kilometers of the Alaska Arctic coastline, um, I actually found it really hard <laughs> to summarize all of the sort of themes and trends out of this really rich and diverse um, set of observations um, uh, just in a matter of five minutes here, but so we're gonna go through this really quickly. Um, so spring 2020, I think, was generally recognized by many of our communities as, a, as more typical of past years, although we still had observations um, suggesting that the land fast ice was relatively thin um, compared to historical standards by many of our observers. Um, certainly in comparison to the spring of 2019, it was, it was better ice. Um, and this translated into successful marine mammal harvests for many of our communities. So this is an observation from Guy Omnik in Point Hope, um, expressing what an awesome past few days they had um, when they did their first harvest of a bowhead whale in, on, on April 22nd. Um, he was the harpooner on that crew. And, um, and then later, another observation um, on May 2nd um, indicated that they were really having a successful um, harvesting season. They actually caught 12 whales, um, including transferred strikes from another community. Um, Utjagvik also, in particular, had a very successful spring whaling season. Uh, we also heard about the improved ice conditions in terms of translating into pretty successful seal harvests across many of the communities in the spring. Um, in particular, Ugrik or bearded seal were among the most important marine um, harvests for Kotzebue. And so Bobby Schaefer, our, our observer there, talked about how it was a spring a lot like um, springs of old, extending their, um, so the, the spring sea ice conditions really extended their hunting season and um, hunter success was excellent. And um, he also referred to how nice and thick the blubber was. We also heard about that um, in other, other communities as well, such as in this picture from uh, Billy Adams and Ike Yagvik. Um, we have fish observations from many of our communities. Um, Guy Omnik in Point Hope is really quite the fisherman. And, um, and so in particular in Kotzebue and Point Hope, we started to hear some comments about changing fish communities, the numbers of um, some of their key fishes, fish species, um, as well as some, some changes in the timing. So um, Guy in Point Hope referred to the fact that they get the different, um, the, each of the different five species of uh, Pacific salmon each year. Um, but in the last few years, they're also getting other species like she fish. Um, and um, that's not common there. The char, which is a, an important species, has been coming back earlier in recent years. Um, Guy also shared photos through a friend of Pacific cod and walleye pollock that were caught in mid-August um, offshore of Point Hope. Um, Bobby Schaefer and Kotzebue also noted low commercial salmon catches of chum. Um, but pointed out that there were like a lot of pink salmon, uh, which was not, um, not a surprise. Uh, fall whaling in 2019, particularly in Utkiagvik, I think a lot of people in this audience know was not good, but um, for 2020, fall whaling actually turned out to be a pretty successful year, um, both in Kaktovik and Utkiagvik. Um, in Utkiagvik, that occurred over a really prolonged August to October season, so as Joe Levitt said um, in Ikiagvik, they started the fall season um, on August 26 and hunt or whalers want to get to whales while they're there. Um, and two whales were taken on the first day. And um, several whales were caught in Ikiagvik. And I think this observation from Billy Adams really sort of solidifies some of those changes that they were seeing. Um, so he talks about how the easterly winds were back in 2020, although in the past few years they experienced more westerly and southerly winds um, during the fall, which had changed the patterns of migratory animals. Um, and that meant that they had to travel much further in the past few years. Um, they endured many dangerous and long hours and many days at sea. However, conditions this fall, uh, beginning in August, came back to normal. They had bowheads, seals, and seabirds, which were closer to shore and feeding on 
what he perceived as what those animals need, um, as well as the indigenous Inupiat. And so um, lastly, more similar to past years, 2020 has also seen um, a pretty warm fall now in early winter, uh, late and low levels of snowfall. And then of course, late sea ice freeze up as well. Um, so this is an observation from Carla Sims Koyatuk in Kaktovik um, from October 21st saying that there wasn't much snow, the lakes keep melting. Um, there was lots of young ice on the ocean just in, um, so that's actually pretty late for Kaktovik um, in late October. And that was the first observations where she talks about the bears, which are persistent in Kaktovik um, nearly year round in her observations. Um, those bears started roaming out um, on the ice, not so much on the sandbar, um, just in late October. Overall, she said it's too warm, there's too much open water and not enough snow. Um, and you can see in the background here is a picture from Wainwright on October 15th. Um, so as of today, only Kaktovik of our communities really has um, solid ice forming in the last few weeks. Utkiavik is starting to see some freeze um, and slush ice is slowly thickening in front of Wainwright, um, but really pretty late freeze up conditions. Okay, so um, this is my last slide. There's lots of ways to keep updated on our AOK observations. Um, notably, we are really regularly posting on our Facebook page. We find that this is actually one of the best ways to stay connected with um, people who are in the communities. And um, I'll also point out we have a newsletter coming out um, soon. And so that's a really good way. We put two newsletters out a year. We send um, paper copies to every uh, mailbox holder in each of our, our communities, but um, I also, of course, have a PDF. And so I'm actually going to put in the chat window a Google Doc where you can, or a, a spreadsheet where you can actually add your email if you would like to receive future copies of our um, AOK newsletter. And um, that's all I've got. Thank you, Donna. Is there a quick question as we change out the, uh, the slides to the next speaker? At this point, otherwise we'll bring it in at the end with a with a, basically as a panel. I do have a quick question. Whoever, uh, let's see. I'm sorry, I've got to get the next person to introduce them, and that's going to be Gay Sheffield. She'll she'll be speaking if you want to set up Gay. But I wanted to ask you your community input. Do you, are, is there a standard form? Do you how do you connect with your local community? Are they inputting through Facebook or how is that? Under yeah, good, great question. We actually have a lot of diverse ways that we connect with our observers. All of our observers are um, paid a monthly stipend. So we stay connected with the same observers throughout and they really are sort of bought in and sharing their observations. Um, and so some observers, you know, like Joe Levitt and Ikiagvik, he actually still hand writes his observations in a notebook and then mails those to us at the end of the month. Um, some of them send emails every day and some of them use an online uh, mobile app that we've created. Excellent, great. Well, we'll come back to that. Thanks a lot, thanks a lot. So our next speaker will be uh, Gay uh, to talk about the Bering Strait food security issues. And I think Meredith, hi, Gay Sheffield, UAF Alaska Sea Grant here in Nome. And um, I think, Meredith, are you going to fire that up or you want me to share screen? Um, if you are able to share screen, I'm taking notes in the background, um, but I can also share if it's... Are you made, have you made me co-host or something? You should be able to share um, with the green button at the bottom. Yep, there you go. There you go. All right, thanks. I am um, 2020 events. Well, I'm surrounded by, there's 10,000 people in the Bering Strait region, all of which are expert observers. So I'm not gonna pretend to, and I'm not gonna try, not pretend, I'm not gonna try to speak for, for people. So I'm gonna speak from my own experience and what um, has come at me regarding concerns. So first, I got two slides. First is what's noted, second are some, issues. It's very difficult to do this in five minutes, so just for future. Um, environment. So we had warm water. We've had um, very strange, uh, very hot spring followed by a very cool summer. I mean 78, 79 degrees in May. And then we got into a, a freeze in July and August situation. Um, we've had warm waters, of course, in the ocean. I'm going to talk about the ocean sea ice quality. 
was we had extent, but it didn't it didn't last. We had a small storm in March, drove it right back. Um, so we we get it. There's changes in that. We it looked like you know everyone says, well, it looked like we kind of came back after 2018, 2019. Well, 2018, 2019 were out of off the charts as far as not good, and so 2020 wasn't back to normal at all. Was it as a record breaker as 2018, 2019? No, but was it off the chart still? Yes, not normal. So for ecology, the impacts of having all these warm water events and, and uh, strange weather events and delay in the ice and so forth is the entire marine ecosystem is in transition. So that's a food security issue. That is. I can talk about the seabirds and the seals, but uh, you know, there's everything. We're talking about an ecosystem in transition. So things like invertebrates and zooplankton, all of it. But the seabirds, um, they we did have another die off. It was smaller. I don't know if that was because of COVID uh, reporting, not being able to get out as much. Um, but of course, it was starvation, and we got information from um, USGS, Alaska Fishery Science, uh, Alaska Science Center in Anchorage. They were able to do their um, research, get back on board with that. It was not HAB related. It does not look HAB related that the birds were feeling queasy and couldn't eat. Um, and it is not disease. Thank you, USGS National Wildlife Health Center. So um, starvation for the birds that were handed in. Seals, I say normal strandings. Um, we have not had the numbers reported of 2018, 2019, and we are not having the numbers of uh, seals in poor body condition reported. However, it's an unusual year we're living in. And so I think we will know more uh, at the close of the fall season. So stay tuned on that. This could be good news, but I would like to know how the populations of seals are doing. Continue with unusual timings and movements, marine mammals, birds, the whole works. Maritime industries. Okay, well, our local king crab season was closed. That's why we have a processor here in Nome. Just didn't happen. But we did catch Pacific cod instead, and it is a fishery that was um, small. This is a small effort locally, but it was uh, good enough that uh, people are going to probably expand on that, especially with king crab, um, even if king crab are caught next year. If the fishery allows for commercial fishing, we'll probably continue with Pacific cod, looks like. Maritime industries, industrial ship traffic. Jackie touched on that. We have industrial ship traffic. The Yamal. LNG um, project, that's a $27 billion project in Sibeta, Russia, now has 15 900 foot ice capable to two and a half meters unassisted LNG tankers. And they're running them uh, all summer. We had certain days where we would have three 900 foot tankers transiting uh, the Bering Strait in the Strait, along with whatever other ship traffic, research, uh, commercial fishery, uh, container, tug, tanker, you name it. Uh, much more than we've seen. And then for impacts of industry, we've had a biogenic oil fouling event. What is a biogenic oil fouling event? It's a non-petroleum oil fouling event that killed uh, several seabirds. We got those in it. it the seabirds that were in poor body condition they had inhaled this material, this sticky white greasy material, and it had uh, caused their death as well as they lost their what thermal insulation they had. Biogenic oil fouling means non-petroleum, so it's typically associated with the rendering industries such as meat, fish, so forth. It's illegal in US waters to shovel that overboard, just so you know, <laughs> it's a thing. And um, foreign marine debris, I'm sure you are all well aware, starting in July and as late as last night, getting reports from uh, marine debris, plastics, a lot of things associated with the commercial fishing industry, consumables, um, men's toiletries, lots of men's toiletries actually, shampoo, um, deodorant, so forth, and hazmats, toilet bowl cleaner, aerosol cans of spray paint, still with the spray in them. Um, aerosol cans of insecticide for roach uh, killing, chemicals, things like that. 
And of course, uh, military, we haven't seen the, the military impacts. Everyone seems aware of the Pollock uh, and uh, Russian naval um, misunderstanding, lack of communication in the Southern Bering Sea. But those missile fire and the 50 ships involved in that drill and the two uh, submarines, that was 60 miles west of Gamble. 50 ships. And here you go. You want food security issues? We have a bunch. In the marine environment, it's all about the ice. It's changing the habitat, right? The entire thing is in transition. The storms are getting stronger. We just had two storms, not that, not a super storm, but did a super amount of erosion in the area uh, because we're being hit now from southerly storms sustained. And uh, it, it did intensify. It was a 956 millibar low. That's pretty low. We didn't get super high winds, but we had a um, lot of wave action out of the southwest. The weather was mentioned earlier. We have changes in the weather. So we're having uh, floods or we're having a drought like we had this summer. And that is affecting things like output into the marine environment, like salmon, salmon survival, salmon production, and other things. Um, the, one thing that would be great to know that all of these are high food security issues in the Bering Strait region, not just marine mammals, not just seabirds, tunicate, invertebrates, uh, zoopla all of it, shrimp, all of it. How is the, what's the productivity, the disease, the harmful algal blooms, the contaminants, the invasives right now, how are these affecting all of it? Are the resources healthy? That is a food security concern throughout the region. Are the resources healthy to eat? Are they healthy to, to continue on? Decision uh, for, for under, um, I guess I better go to uh, industry. I'll just, I won't go through them, but you can see from having large industrial ship traffic, these are known, these are things that are, are uh, really big issues and concerns. The noise. Having just physically large vessels, what does that mean for the bowhead whale, the humpback whale, the North Pacific right whale that's in the corridor of the Northern Bering Sea, much less all the seals, walrus, so forth, people. Um, pollution. And then of course, industrial gear, we are seeing both our US fleet uh, large, this is the large fleet for Pacific Cod, and also on the Russian side, the Pollock trawling and the Pacific Cod coming up earlier, staying longer and so forth. And now the Russians had their first, I believe it was either a test fishery or a real fishery of Pollock. They went up trawling, commercial trawling in the Southern Chukchi Sea this year. There's a lot of things they might bump into. Um, and then one of the things that really doesn't go under much is that disregard of existing rules. So we have rules in place internationally regarding plastics and and uh, hazmat dumping overboard and things like that. But uh, you know, who enforces this stuff? What, what, is the, what do we do about people who just disregard some rules? We don't know in the Bering Strait, we're learning all this real quick. So I guess other food security issues that, that deal with decision makers and planners is the lack of regional and local representation at decision making and planning. Um, and that, then the result of that is like, you have five minutes to, to hear from me. I can't, you know, so there's a comprehensive awareness going on in the Bering Strait region. Everyone here is really comprehensively aware at the ecosystem level and what's going on. We may not understand all that's coming our way, but, um, but certainly we're dealing with what we deal with in a big holistic ecosystem kind of way. And so, only getting uh, snapshots of, or little vignettes makes it probably difficult for decision makers to be able to do the best that they, they can uh, if they're urban based. Um, is science ready to respond to a marine ecosystem in transition? And then that goes into search, search and rescue ready to respond for these big issues about industrial traffic in a confined transboundary narrow waterway. International comms. I'd love to know what the next steps are. I'd love for this region to be a part of the next steps of what that is. I don't know what it means when we have transboundary shared marine resources in a, in a time of transition and we're not communicating. We need to communicate. <laughs> and we kind of see what happens when we don't, 
the, the military action and the Pollock fishy, you know, everybody actually did what they were supposed to do, but nobody had communicated. And so I'm sure we all know, you know, lack of communication and so forth, things can happen um, and they get exciting. And then you got to spend a lot of time calming them down <laughs> and then you move forward. And then objectives for regional comps. So we get a lot now on regional communications and I think that's awesome. We get a lot of interest in regional communications and I'm, I'm so excited about that. What would be really great is to understand clearly what are the objectives of people uh, wanting to communicate with the region or, or taking communications uh, out of the region, that sort of thing. All right. Thank you. I bet you that was over five minutes. That's okay, Gay. Thanks, right. thanks a lot. And I think as we transition, if anybody has a question, but there's a this is just the beginning of a series, so I think there'll be some more focal times to take up some of these points at, at, at uh, additional webinars. But thank you very much. If anybody has a question for Kate right now, if you if you decouple your screen and we'll let uh, uh, who's coming up, Lauren, connect up. Does anybody have a question for Kate? Otherwise, put it in the chat. Put it in the chat. Put it in the chat. <laughs> All right, great, thanks. So uh, the next speaker is gonna be uh, Lauren Devine. She's gonna talk about the Indigenous Sentinels Network. Is she here? Yes, I am. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. My name is Lauren Devine. I work for the Aleut Community of St. Paul Island and I wanted to share some observations related to food security from, from the region that I work in, um, which is the Pribilof Islands and we collect information through the Indigenous Sentinels Network um, and it's an environmental monitoring program. I don't wanna to spend too much time on the background of it because I, I really do wanna share the observations as they relate to food security. I think that's um, the best for the meat of the conversation today. And I know we're running short on time. Uh, and so these observations are either scientific, standardized, repeatable data that have been collected or in the form of um, an observation that's been collected. We, we have various different forms uh, of surveys, of uh, observation collecting. And so we kind of have a, a hodgepodge of different things to provide the context to the science that we're collecting. Um, but for, for the marine ecosystem of the Purple Off Islands, I just wanted to share um, kind of what, what's been seen as it relates to food security. Of course, the Purple Off Islands are marine mammal harvesters, particularly northern fur seals. And so every summer um, we have a subadult male harvest. It's not using firearms, so they're clubbed, uh, rounded up and clubbed, and then uh, tri tribal members are allowed to, um, to butcher and, and take seal um, at the site and take it home. And typically during this time, we have staff from the tribal government that are there to collect blood samples, blubber, liver, muscle, bile. Uh, we correct, co collect a range of tissues for contaminants analysis to archive with the uh, National Marine Mammal Tissue Bank. Uh, with some collaborations, we send different tissues and samples to university researchers, to agency researchers. And because of the COVID mandates, we experienced a gap in that data collection this year. So we didn't really have any other data collection other than we collect the length of 50% of harvested seals and the snout where we take the teeth out and use that to age the seal. And that's a long-term data set that is decades old. And that's really the only one that we were able to maintain, unfortunately, this year. Um, so we don't have any of those tissue samples. That's an issue for our tribal members because we do track contaminants. We look at the health of seals um, that are being harvested. And uh, we just don't have those data this year. We also had a pup harvest that just kind of wrapped up because pups are starting to leave the island um, for overwintering and, and head out to the greater North Pacific. We did not have any data collection from those pups as well. And so although we're addressing food security through being able to meet um, and have these harvests, we, we implemented all kinds of COVID mandates um, on island to ensure that you know we had small groups that we had um, only 
healthy individuals. We, we still don't have any cases in the Pribilofs. We're hoping to keep it that way. And so we were able to, to meet community need for resources, um, but we, the science side and, and kind of long-term monitoring um, has really caused a big gap this year in our understanding the population of fur seals. We also harvest stellar sea lion, which we have been able to follow up with hunters on an individual basis and be able to collect samples from harvested um, sea lions. Typically, there's not a lot of hunting during the summertime. Now we're starting to see an uptick in um, harvest. We also collect things like the um, the muscle tissue or the liver and the canines with which to age the, the individuals. And we are seeing pretty typical um, harvest of, of animals uh, for cellular sea lions. Like Gay mentioned as well, we're not seeing any uptick in marine mammal strandings, which is encouraging, but we are cautiously optimistic there. Um, we have experienced and, and seen higher incidences of stranded animals in the past in conjunction with UMEs um, that are more statewide and, and, um, and across the region. But this year we have not seen any increased incident of uh, stranded animals. Our seabirds also appeared consistent with previous years. And I, I don't say typical because we have been seeing some really unusual things happen with our seabirds, but we were not part of any unusual or mass die-offs during the summer. Now that we're into the fall and we have really big storms, um, our, our winter storms and wave action washes things offshore or buries things under, buries, um, you know, carcasses under seaweed or sand. But thus far, all of our surveys have not indicated anything unusual or inconsistent with at least um, the year since 2016. And uh, like uh, er I think Erica mentioned earlier, berries, we did see a very good harvest of berries. They were more abundant than they have been. And again, this is since 2016, we really started seeing decline and full failure of berry plots on island. And um, this year, we finally had a really good robust um, harvest of berries. And all that occurs in the Privlofs is crowberry or moss berry. So those, those are the berry patches that I'm referring to. We did um, see some of that foreign marine debris. Finally, it took a long time to wash in, but we got our first reports recently from St. George that there were foreign um, plastics like Gay had described earlier, um, you know, householdish type products that we don't typically see. In our marine debris, which we do get a lot of in the Privilofs, it's typically fishing gear, uh, overwhelmingly large um, or fishing related gear. And this time we are seeing some of that foreign debris wash in. So we're tracking that and um, working with, with the NOAA Marine Debris Program and um, paying attention to what's, what folks are seeing in the North so that we can uh, kind of put into context what we're seeing Microplastics is the main concern with our marine debris as far as food security is concerned. And so um, seeing any kind of large dumping of foreign debris is um, definitely paid attention to by the community. And we're really wondering kind of what the impacts on the food web are um, with this particular foreign incident that happened. Um, for harmful algal blooms, we do track harmful algal blooms. We've seen detected uh, sex toxin in our environment and, and seabirds that have been tested in the past as part of um, large mass die-offs in recent years. Um, this year, we started testing limpets um, from the nearshore environment because that's what our tribal members are consuming. And we did detect um, sex toxin, but not above any type of commercial limits. Um, we are super interested in conversations about the method of testing and how to get at and address human health concerns with harmful algal bloom tests, uh, what you're testing, how you're testing it, timeframes. Um, that's a huge priority for our uh, tribal members. And um, really, I think that's the biggest thing. Our temperature and salinities have been increasing steadily in the last, you know, however many years, along with every other community. So those concerns certainly are um, at the top of tribal member concerns for, for food security and just how these ecosystem level changes and this shift that we've heard uh, others talk about in this, you know, webinar and, and every other conversation that we've been a part of, um, how this is impacting the future of our ability to um, 
you know, enable food security and, and access to resources on, on our islands. And so I think that's all I wanted to mention and I'll, I'll hopefully saved a little bit of time for questions. All right, Lauren, thank you so much. And uh, as we de-share on this, uh, before we go on to uh, Charlene, if there's a question for Lauren, happy to take it or we can put it in the chat box and talk, speak about it at the end. Okay, Lauren, we're gonna come back. Uh, okay, um, the, our final speaker is gonna be Charlene Apoch. She's in health research and she's going to be speaking of uh, food security issues. And I would just mention when we open in discussion, it's open to everybody <laughs> it, it, that's joining in here, local community members, uh, whoever. So Charlene, you're up. Hi, thank, thank, hi thank you for having me. Ubanga Charlene Apak, Anupak Siska Akpik, Chinik Mew Gurunga, Suli Nachirvik Mew Gurunga. Uh, my name is Charlene Apuk and my Nupak name is Akpik. My family is from Gullivan and White Mountain. So I appreciate seeing familiar faces to our region and um, hearing the sharebacks. And I know we have such limited time, um, but I wanted to, when given the opportunity to share about food security in this meeting, I wanted to um, link together some of the ways that COVID has had impacts and the immediate um, things that communities are facing in regards to food security. And I don't have slides for such a short presentation, um, but I just wanted to move through some of the, the things that I've personally observed as a community member. Um, although I reside on Denina lands here in Anchorage, I'm closely connected to my home community in the Bering Straits. Um, one of the first things that, you know, I'm sure that many of you in your circles and spaces, um, no matter where you're from, that you've heard from some of these ways of getting input from the communities, you know, this summer with COVID was, of course, you know, being able to go out on the land and to do fish camp and to do our harvesting that we usually do in the summers. And I know for many of us, it was really, really hard to decide if it was safe for us to go home and to do that. Um, was it safe for our communities, you know, especially coming from an urban center, if we were going to, <clears throat> you know, risk bringing COVID from somewhere like Anchorage to our regions. <clears throat> and then, of course, respecting the each of the communities policies that they had around COVID during that time as well. Um, and for me, I know some of the things that I was weighing was I have a five-year-old son and this is a really important time for him to connect back home. It's an important time that he's taught by our aunts and our uncles and it's important time with family. And, um, you know, I ultimately did choose to go home with the support and encouraging of my family back home. They made sure that we followed strict um, testing and quarantining and things like that, um, you know, and, but it was, it was, I changed my mind every day if I was going to do it or not. Um, and then, you know, some of the impacts at the, at the state level, of course, is that um, regarding COVID and food security, we immediately saw the way that our systems are built with planes and ferries and shipments going out to rural communities for store and food bought store-bought foods, um, that those were cut off and we immediately had, we were facing food insecurity within a week. And it's just, and part of the reason that that is an exasperated experience is because we have so many regulations and um, being able to fully depend and um, subsist off of our way of life is, is still, you know, another threat to our food security. And so I just want to highlight some of those structures um, that we really have to think about in this conversation of food security and that COVID has really made very apparent. Um, and, you know, even, and then to the state level, right, across communities, there's many events such as subsistence and um, summer gathering fish camps. Um, that have have changed. I, I was able to go home for fish camp, but I couldn't go for moose hunting, you know, like it, and we're weighing that all across the state. Um, and, you know, there's also public hearing processes for some of these things were were impeded. I know for I know all of you have adjusted and adapted to planning doing these meetings on zooms, but how do we 
you know, keep engaging. I loved hearing that um, <laughs> one of the up north, they still send in paper letters. Um, and I love that. I love to hear that that's being done because right now, again, the impacts of food security and the ways that we engage our communities with COVID um, is constantly being navigated. And then finally, um, you know, and then across the state, you know, the ways that we share our food. So gatherings such as Nalukatuk. Um, I know I go to Nalukatuk every year and I also wasn't able to do that. Um, and, you know, for families who couldn't go home for, for fish camp, not every family is able to do the expenses of Gold Streak and sending Maktuk or sending um, dry fish or fish back home, you know, and so, our food sharing system was greatly impacted too and continues to be even with caribou hunting going on right now you know just the, our ability to to be and to share with one another across the state and the the way that we distribute our harvests um i think has been has been really visible as well and then finally at the federal level you know with covid and with threats to food security there's many um you know, there's land leasing going on that administration is trying to push through quickly. Um, and the ways that are things like the Willow Project or the, the Refuge, those things are direct threats to our food security. And what we've defined, self-defined um, as necessary to our well-being. And so the impacts, you know, I, I appreciate all of these presentations and um, Gail, you know, trying to sum it in five minutes is nearly impossible, um, but definitely, you know, mental health and the ways that we connect and the ways that we share and the ways that we're connected to our culture, the land and these practices, um, our spiritual practices. And so um, there's so many impacts from that, from the crossing of COVID and food security that I'm observing throughout our communities. And, um, you know, one of the, the biggest, you know, we're navigating these contradictions. Um, and one of, I think one of the ways that we can most certainly ensure continued access and food sovereignty is of course their self-determination and allowing our communities to define what's going to work in their adaptation. So that's my, my five minute um, reflections on, COVID and our impacts of health and well-being um, with food security. And yeah, thank you for allowing me this space and sorry to rush through, but I appreciated listening to everyone else as well. I don't want to go over. Yes, yeah, Charlene, thank you so much. And don't run away because we're actually going to keep the line open for open discussions for Charlene. And if there are any other uh, uh, local community observations that like people would like to to bring forward. We're kind of moving into the open discussion section now. First, I'll ask, does anybody have a question for Charlene specifically before we open the panel? I don't see anything yet. Charlene, have you it. looked at um, some of these discussions and how community interactions are um, acting? Are we having any statistical analysis? Um, I, I see this as uh, ways that there could be increases in community violence because we don't have enough families having all the resources they need in some of these conflicts. Has there been any look at that kind of stuff? Yeah, there are some um, some research being done about that. And so, for example, um, early on in COVID, there was quickly pulled some information about um, that and I think that it showed like a 25% increase in violence and calls to law enforcement within the first um, two months of COVID along those lines. So absolutely. And we know that not having access to basic needs and having, um, you know, things like food, shelter, things like that exasperate all of that kind of stress and tension. So thank you for asking. Thank you. So we're, we're in the open discussion mode. If it, are there any further questions by, to any of the speakers, to Charlene and then any of the others that are still online? I see all their faces. This is Lauren. I actually have a question. Maybe best for you, Jackie. 
<laughs> well, we've, we've, um, invertebrates is, is kind of overlooked um, from community members in our region, but there is some awareness and questions of it's, it's almost a black box. And I know Gay mentioned invertebrates as well. Um, and, and we've heard that a few times, but what are data kind of looking like for community changes or impacts to the invertebrate community with all of these ecosystem changes that might be impacting you know, communities. Right, right. And I think that's an important because of course, uh, benthic invertebrates are near and dear to my heart. And uh, I, when we actually had a discussion in the Alaska Eskimo Whaling Commission was concerns about some of the, uh, the like the, the, the sea onions, and I think you call them umpa that come up on the beach, they're suspension feeders, they feed off of uh, some of these uh, phytoplankton and so forth, and they're being consumed by uh, uh, local populations. So the invertebrates are at the particularly in the northern Bering Chukchi, the benthic invertebrates, the ones that live in the mud or on top, are really, can, they accumulate and they live a long time. So they're really quite a, an important cast of characters for big animals that people see as iconic, the walrus, you know, uh, gray whales and uh, bearded seals that are considered to, in our important uh, food, particularly bearded seals and walruses. Um, I think that, you know, invertebrates are like, uh, everybody talks about the zooplankton and, the, and that we're seeing lots more krill. It's sometimes washing up off the Ustiavik that like this year because of wind changes. But the, it's the same thing that'll impact benthic animals along the coast and bring them up the nearshore ones. And so people eat those. Um, we are seeing changes in populations, particularly clam populations. They're being, the Arctic ones are contracting northwards. We're seeing declines in some of the prey base from our, some of these big iconic animals. But there are uh, an, an, a movement in a, some sub-Arctic type species that can outcompete, grow faster, um, that part of it. The other thing is that without the sea ice and the, the, one thing about the Arctic, you like to grow them fat. Lipids are an important part of this and lipids tend to also accumulate contaminants. So the, the benthic invertebrate uh, food web is an important, particularly in the, in the northern Bering Chukchi areas where it's such a shallow continental shelf. And they are allow you to have decadal views of population changes because they live a long time. And you can use parts of them. You can use their shells, you can to understand and to evaluate changes in water chemistry and temperature. So, you know, I, I'd be an advocate on any local community looking more at the, their nearshore invertebrate populations. Jackie, this is Gay with a comment. Or, sure. Or, yeah, hi, Lauren. Hey, Jackie, everybody. Um, so the NOAA ecosystem, what do they call that? Status report, the ESR, mm. is supposed to come out for the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council in December, I think. Anyway, that should have an overview for that that includes invertebrates. And and it, I know Pribs is really different than Northern Bering Sea, but I think they try to um, cover it. And you know, it's a hard year with no really little ship data, but I think the pribs are more positioned with, um, you're in that kind of Southern Bering Sea fisheries area. That's well instrumented, much better than up here, I think. And so, so you probably, there may be more for you there in that report as well. And it's kind of a, I think it's an overview hmm. that helps. Okay. Thanks, Gay. Yeah, and yeah, thanks, Gay. Actually, the, the reason that I asked is um, when we were contributing to the ESR, Ebet, Sidden, um, actually said, you know, invertebrates is one area that we know virtually nothing about. And so I was curious. Yeah. And, and that, I guess, especially this COVID year, my comment would be that so many people could have been calling the coast and, and really this would have been a great, I thought we'd be inundated with all these researchers calling and trying to reach out for communications because who better? I mean, people here all up and down the coast see and know every day when they're subsistence harvesting or commercial harvesting for that matter, if they're on the water outside, this would have been a great, um, COVID would have been a great, uh, I was hopeful that it might integrate people more into the value of the coast, you know, over not just one. Right, but, but I, I wouldn't give up on, on that, Gay, because I think that particularly we're in a long haul for this COVID. Yeah, you know? I think we are. We would have a second shot at that apple. No, no, not, that's not a good thing, but oh, I'm saying, but it might instill people to be more integrative, you know, on, on coastal. Reach out. Reach out. That's right. 
and there's a little more in our time now than you know to to put something in the field and the coastal community connection so i think there's no better time than now starting in it and i think there's community uh we've heard some of them today and some that are developing to be able to build on that and i think it's there's no better time than right now to start building expanding on that any other questions that want to be brought forward i know we're over time but this is a great conversation i think this is rosemary and um We've seen an increased utilization of hunters coming through the Dalton Highway into our area. Um, and it seems like there's a higher demand put on to our subsistence resources with many in the state. And this could be very concerning, especially in light of the um, past caribou counts that showed three herds in severe decline. Um, is that anything others are seeing? No, that, that was a good question. I don't know if there's anybody has a response. If she was asking if anybody else has been seeing hunters coming in into the communities for subsistence for hunting or animals that are normally under the local community. So, well, this is gay. Certainly, we're talking land animals here, Rosemary. I would say certainly people, there were food security concerns. And there was more pressure, I believe, on things like moose in our in the Nome area. We've got the a little bit of our road system, and people can come in from. It's easier for people from outside the road system to come. And I know our our hunt was maybe for moose was like less than seventy two hours for the Nome, hmm. the Nome district. Um, very quick season, um, but that's a good question. That would be a good question for the fishing game. They probably wouldn't be able to answer that. Thank you, though, for bringing that up. Good question. All right. Are there any other comments or questions? And I see that there's a uh, Danielle's put a note in here about uh, using this forum to have some more of these type of discussions, more detailed about environmental local observer uh, observations, and maybe utilize this as a platform within the IRPIC to have more detailed or more regular discussions of community observations. I'll ask last question. Okay. I'll better shut up. But <laughs> when people do this forum, what is it going to, what then is going to be done with the information that's gathered here? Is this a place where the community members get to, I mean, is it for science or? It's for, for, it's for both, Gay. I think like everything that's been recorded on here, it's available so anybody who can access it by the internet, which of course has some disparity in coastal communities that in and itself is a question how to make people wired in the coastline. But the idea is to build on this and, and like there's self-forming teams. So you could have a self-forming team of which we just had discussions on community health or or any of the questions that came, came up. And that's what uh, was put in there, uh, the observation that Danielle put. So the thing is that there's these webinar and it connects to, you've got 50, had 55 people on here that agency folks are listening. They may not be uh, putting in, but they're listening to community input, they're listening to the science input. So I think it's actually, is a, we think this is a living form and it says that every month we have, you know, for a marine ecosystem, we bounce in between different topics, but it could be focused in on just a few questions that were brought up and there just needs to have some advocates for doing it and working with Mer Meredith to then have those questions more on a regular basis as a, as a potential for a site for input. So and does that have these standard working groups, Gabe, with all, but there's also these self-forming teams. No, and I know, but but for the for for the federal management of marine resources, when we're talking management and communities, research and management. Mm -hmm. for, for all the marine mammals, all the seabirds, blah, blah, blah. Is this gonna be, we have a communication network regulatorily that, that co-management and whatnot. Does this then enhance that somehow? We have rural advisory committee meetings. We have all kinds of meetings, but if we're gonna be having good discussion here, how do you rope in the, um, is this then the platform for people to talk about issues that are relating to co-management co or federal regulatory issues. I don't know, I don't know. 
and yeah. there, there is a, a whole nother avenue and that I know you're trying to get everyone to come here, but, but maybe it needs a bigger. Yeah. But I don't know about everybody coming. I, I think it was, yeah, it was, as a forum on just the topic. No, no, you're fine. But how to bring, you know, the, the scientists, we all talk about food security, you know, from like, I'm on a big ship, right. And I'm collecting certain things and then to get the coastal input. And I know there's all these co-management. I never go to those co-management. How do you entrain Alaska state of Alaska, and that's one thing that I think the inner agencies at the federal level and this group is saying, how do we bring in more of that? But then what is gonna come out of it? We are not a co-management. We're not focusing on that specific question, but it does allow an education to people that could provide input to that. And how that happens, I don't know for sure, but this is, it's kind of the open forum for a lot of different disciplines science, but, but I know what you want, you know, you want a, a pathway down to that. And then I can't give that to you. Except no, no, I, I think there's, sure. there actually is a discussion for two different yeah. types of science going on. One is the everyday regulatory world of which we live in as, as a regional entity with moose or caribou with bearded seal and walrus. We have managers, we have a system in play that's a, that we're trying to work on, you know, to get that. And then there's science like, um, science like NSF funded science that sort of shows up and people come from afar. And then that that's like a different kind of science. And somehow I'd like to see everybody get a little bit more um, integrated. integrated regionally so that when you get the, because we do have these communication networks. Anyway, I better, yeah, but that's it, okay. It's it's to think about. Yeah. And Gay, thank you for that. And Jackie, and I know that there are those on the call who are also involved with the RNA around food security, they might have had to drop off, but I think that um, Hi Hio's on here and they um, are um, might help to bridge that as well. Another important topic for assessing in our food security is the increase in search and rescue missions that will likely occur. We saw that in Nooksuit with the changes to our lands and waters and the increased activity affecting the animals that we depend on. And our families were having to travel farther, multiple hunts, and uh, it led to a lot of breakdown of equipment and more rescue missions. Um, I, I'm worried about some of these issues that are going to happen because the hardship uh, has gone through so many layers and many people don't have the replacement parts and supplies that need to be renewed on a regular basis to travel our environment. And on top of that, the rivers are more dangerous, right? The ice is more dangerous. We lost some people, a man driving a very, very knowledgeable man driving a four wheeler on some ice, gone. You know, we, it's very, uh, yeah, it compounds itself. And then we don't have a Coast Guard up here, right? So we're all on it. We're self-rescued, just. But you will have the Coast Guard up there a little bit pretty soon, right? You're going to have the Polar Polar Star up there for. Polar a Star is coming with no aviation detachment. So ah. we will have a icebreaker though. We're okay. It'll be well, good I think at this point, we're, we're kind of, uh, the people are starting to have to drop. No, you're doing great. But I, I think what came out of this is that we, there are a lot of questions we could continue type of discussions. And I know, I just guess, I think it's time I'm, we might have to pull off, but I think if Hio is still on or Kelly wants to say anything about that research, because I think it was noted in the coordination of coordination network, if that's how this might facilitate the food security aspects and coastal observations and community. If there's no word, I'm going to leave it at this. What's in the comment, Kelly? I see your face in there. Where's Hio? Okay. Yeah, I was just doing a little thinking. Um, I think that we are trying to to kind of find a way to 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 further facilitate these sorts of conversations. Um, I've been involved in some kind of preliminary con uh, conversations with um, with Donna and Lauren and. Um, also the LCC community, Aaron Poe, um, to just kind of like talk about how do we do this? How do we further integrate across all of these um, existing networks? So the RNA will be hopefully plugged into that. Um, what about the tribes? Yeah, so we, we are working directly through the AOS Food Security Working Group, which is made up of indigenous members. Um, 
what's are you asking what the AOS food security working group is? <laughs> so um, the Arctic Observing Summit uh, came together last year um, and they formed these different working groups and a particular um, one this year was called the Food Security Working Group and it's made up of Pan-Arctic membership, um, a combination of scientists and indigenous participants and, and uh, community members who um, their goal was essentially to come together to talk about what are kind of the key observations um, from both a, a Western science and an indigenous knowledge point of view to come together around um, how to support food security. Um, the RNA is focusing this effort through the food security working group, um, particularly on the, the Pacific Arctic sector. Um, and we're kind of taking our lead from them on what to really focus on in terms of observations. Thank you. Yeah, and I can, um, I'll, I'll follow up with you offline. <laughs> That'd be great. I, I think maybe you could even, I put it on my slide, but you could put maybe in the chat box uh, how to get to that yeah. website. Um, but personally, I, I'm late for my faculty meeting that I'm supposed to present out, so I, I have to get off. So I'm going to go ahead and let you talk if you want. And Meredith, you can take it on. But I want to say thank you to all and all the collaborative teams, all the presenters, for all the uh, uh, great uh, words that you and presentations you made and the conversation that went on as long, as well as the local uh, community observing uh, folks. So thank you. Meredith, I'm going to give it back to you. Thank you, Jackie. Okay. Kathy, you can take closure. Bye. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everyone. Um, I guess I'll leave um, a little bit of space for any final questions, but it looks like people are signing off, but I want to make sure everyone has a chance. Okay. And um, I want to let everyone know that we don't have any solid plans for food security meetings, but we will be continuing this discussion and building out um, follow up meetings with the observing team um, and connecting with the RNA um, that was mentioned here. So trying to integrate those pieces, I think will be really important. Any final comments? Uh, and no, just thanks to all the speakers today. Yeah. Yep, thank you very much. Yes, big thanks to all the speakers. And I wanted to mention that if you want to continue the conversation on the IARPIC events page for this webinar, if you scroll down, there's a comments form there. And you can at tag any of the presenters today to continue the conversation in that chat. So those of you watching this recording, please uh, feel free to cont contribute to the conversation that way. Thanks so much for joining us.